busy schedule today. He's leaving, uh, flying out of PDX right after our meeting, so we're going to stop, uh, finish up promptly at 1.15. As you can see, today's program is a popular one. In fact, we sold out very early to City Club members and their guests. Being able to pre-register for special events such as the State of the State is just one of the many benefits of membership in the City Club. And today we have two more incentives to announce. Katie King is here to tell us a little bit more about these offers. Katie is not only chair of the club's membership committee, but she's also a local mystery novel author, and she's the Intergovernmental Relations Liaison for Health Services for the Department of Human Services. Katie. Club members and guests. There are so many exciting things happening at City Club this spring that this is the perfect time to share the club with your colleagues, your friends, your family, or anyone else who's interested in issues of public involvement and civic engagement. And not only will you have the opportunity to improve your community and to meet the people who make things happen, you can win fabulous prizes. <laughs> New members who have joined this week, including here and now at the Friday Forum, will be entered into a drawing to win a special romance hotel package courtesy of Fifth Avenue Suites in downtown Portland. It includes chilled champagne, rose petals scattered on the bed, and breakfast delivered to your room. Romantic partner not included. <laughs> For a chance to win our romance package, simply give your completed form to a City Club staff person. Over the next few months, we'll continue to hold weekly drawings of surprise rewards for new members. We're also temporarily waiving the $25 new membership fee. And we've got something special for current members, too. The person who recruits the highest number of new members over the course of the spring membership drive will be treated to a Friday Forum lunch with a Celebrity City Club member. We're, we're keeping his identity a secret, but here's a week. Uh, here's our weekly hint. He's a member of Congress, and the first part of the, of his, the last part of his first name rhymes with flower. And that's not all. The very first person to hand me their completed membership application gets to have their photo taken with our governor at the end of this program. There has never been a better time to join the club, and the fun starts now. <laughs> It's front page news, it's an election issue, and it's a cultural divide. And now the controversy over the protection or extension of marriage will be the focus of a special evening city club forum called Marriage, the State of the Union. This event will take place at the World Trade Center on Wednesday, March 17th at 5.30. Rather than holding another polarized debate, we've assembled a learned panel who will take a thoughtful look at the institution of marriage from a number of political, religious, and cultural viewpoints. Dr. Bill Lunch, Professor and Chair of Political Science, uh, the Political Science Department at OSU, as well as an OPB political analyst, he'll be our moderator. On the panel are Senior Rabbi Emmanuel Rose of Congregation Beth Israel in Portland, Dr. Leslie Harris, Professor at the University of Oregon School of Law, Dr. Reb Rebecca Warner, Professor and Chair of Oregon State University's Department of Sociology, Professors, Professors, Professor Stephen Cantor, who teaches constitutional law at Lewis and Clark, and Mary Kitch, Associate Editor at the Oregonian. The forum is open to the public, admission is free to club members, and $5 for non-members. No advanced registration is necessary, but if you'd like further information, contact staff members or look at the City Club Bulletin. Finally, Throughout March, Citizens Read, City Club's book discussion group, will be reading local author Jewel Lansing's book titled Portland, People, Politics, and Power, 1851 to 2001. Mike Burton will moderate a discussion of this book on Monday, March 29th at the Zimmerman Community Center in the Pearl District. City Club has uh, copies available for purchase and 10% of sales benefit the club. Watch your bulletin or check the website for further details. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Kaiser Permanente, 
Pope and Talbot Inc. and Shorebank Pacific. We're grateful for their support. On to our program. Governor Kulingowski, I hope you and our audience will forgive me if I forgo the customary extended biographical introduction with its references to your duty in the Marines, your long political career, and your distinguished service as legislator, insurance commissioner, attorney general, and Supreme Court judge. Instead, I would like to recall your first State of the State speech to the City Club a year ago. At the time, Oregon was facing one of its most trying periods in recent history. Our unemployment rate was the highest in the nation. We faced a state government budgetary crisis that by some measures was the worst in the nation. And many Oregonians despaired of seeing solutions from a legislature torn by partisan anger. Your 2003 State of the State speech motivated us at a time we really needed it with optimism and enthusiasm. One of your key themes was that as long as we believe in ourselves and never forget that we are one people living in an extraordinary place, we will not only survive, but thrive. A year later, your unshakable optimism remains, but so do many of the challenges we faced a year ago. I won't dwell on those either. We hardly need to be reminded of the failure of ballot measure 30, the continued economic challenges facing the state, and the social tensions that divide us, urban and rural Oregonians, gay and straight Oregonians, and Republican and Democratic Oregonians. Instead, I invite you to review with us the challenges and the victories of your first year in office and to reinvigorate us with your unquenchable enthusiasm and energy that have marked the, your first year in office. And I invite you to share with us your dream for Oregon. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. It's a pleasure to be here. My fellow Oregonians, I'm going to talk to you today about my vision for Oregon, what we've accomplished together, and where I intend to lead this great state the next three years. But for a brief moment, I want to put aside all of the usual topics of a State of the State address and ask you to think about and remember two simple truths. The first is that many of Oregon's sons and daughters are still in harm's way in Iraq and Afghanistan. Several have died in the line of duty. These young soldiers are my heroes. They are the best Oregon has to offer. And until they are all back safely in the arms of their families, the state of our state will never be fully whole. The second truth is that we live in the best state and the best nation in the world. With the challenges we face, and there are many, it's easy to forget how fortunate we are to call this beautiful and economically bountiful state our home. Sometimes we ride the wave of progress without having to hope for more. Other times we need to put hope front and center and remember how blessed we are to live here. If there's one place on earth where justice and dignity are always stronger than the passion of the moment and hope is always stronger than fear, it is right here in Oregon. Times change, economics change, but the gift of Oregon does not change. This is still the best place to live and raise a family. So what is the state of our state today? As your governor, I can report to you that Oregon is strong and getting stronger. I say that knowing full well that many Oregonians are frustrated with their government and have been for a long time. I share many of those frustrations. They led me to run for governor in the first place. For much of the last decade, Oregon governments seem to be taking an extended tour away from common sense. The economy was booming, but instead of using those good times to make a great state even better, the legislature let the clock tick away on government reforms, crumbling roads and bridges, and saving for a rainy day. As the budgets grew, they actually cut our commitment to higher education, 
paid little attention to job creation and economic opportunity and pursued fiscal policies that left us with a, with a budget that was financially unsustainable. All of this took place, not surprisingly, during a period of unprecedented partisanship in a state long known as a place where Democrats and Republicans worked together. It was enough to make many Oregonians shout, just like Howard Beale in the movie Network, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. I didn't shout, but I did roll up my sleeves, I did step on the gas, and now I'm steering Oregon away from the detour we've been on and back toward a stronger economy and responsible budgeting. This new direction for Oregon is a shared achievement. I've worked closely with members of both parties. Yes, we have our differences on some issues, but we negotiated and compromised without the destructive partisan rancor of past years. I said I would set a new tone in, in Salem, and I have. I said I would govern with an open door, and I have. And I said I would work across party lines to turn Oregon's economy around, and I have. As a result, during a time of recession and painful budget choices, we still made great progress for Oregon. I'm going to talk about that progress, but first I want to tell you about some of the good economic news in Oregon. Just last week, we announced that state revenue has grown by $120 million over our previous forecasts, 76 million of which is money not spent during the 0103 budget cycle. To give you an idea what $76 million can buy, it's enough to hire 385 state police officers or add five days to the school calendar. About half of the $76 million comes from program savings, but the other half comes from administrative overhead belt tightening by state agencies. We cut the cost of doing business. By working smarter, We've stretched our tax dollars, steering money to vital programs and services that otherwise might have been cut. The $545 million in cuts that the legislature mandated if Measure 30 was defeated still must be made and will be made. But at least for now, it appears that the rest of the projected revenue shortfall has been eliminated because state government is more efficient and our economy is recovering. This is very good news. The news on jobs is also looking better, although we have a long way to go. There was a very small uptick in our January unemployment rate, but the overall trend for the past six months has improved, and I think that trend will continue. We're actually starting to insource jobs. Major companies, including high-tech giants like Sun Microsystems and Intel, are moving jobs from California to Oregon. This is not an accident. It is the result of actions my administration has, has taken to improve the business climate in Oregon. California businesses recognize that Oregon has a big cost advantage, especially workers' compensation, which I led the reform of, form of more than 10 years ago. I've said this many times before, but I'll say it again. A jobs recovery that is just high tech and just in the Willamette Valley will never be good enough for me. That's why I'm working with the legislature to bring jobs to every region of this state. In the last year, I spent countless hours with company executives to create new employment opportunities in Oregon. That hard work is paying off. T-Mobile brought 750 jobs to Redmond. Cardinal Glass brought 70 jobs to Hood River. Brentwood Corporation created 70 jobs in Malawa. Jobs were also created or retained in Ontario, Baker City, Grants Pass, Astoria, Tumalo, and many other Oregon communities. We just last week were working with Keystone RV and Pendleton. The outcome of our talks is that the company, that company will add 125 jobs to its current workforce of 350. All of these new and retained jobs are a clear sign that the worst is behind us. 
but I am far from satisfied. That's why I'm going to keep selling Oregon's competitive advantages, and I'm going to keep strengthening those advantages by investing in education and workforce training. I'll have more to say about that in a few minutes. There are other signs that Oregon and Oregon's economy is strong and getting stronger. Most of our export industries, especially high technology manufacturing, are outperforming their national competitors. The most advanced semiconductor work in the world is done here in Oregon. The greatest threat to the solvency of this state, the huge unfunded liability of the public employee retirement system has been brought under control. This, too, required bipartisan support. PERS reform will save taxpayers in Oregon over $9 billion. And what may be the most important sign that Oregon is getting stronger, the days of business as usual in state government are over. This is a work in progress, but we already have a real record of improving government efficiency and getting the most out of every dollar. We're merging data and network centers, saving taxpayers 20 to $40 million per biennium. We're modernizing the way government makes purchases, again saving an estimated $20 million each biennium. We're merging 30 separate motor pools, cutting the number of SUVs, and using and bringing in more natural gas vehicles for cleaner air and lower fuel cost. Even in my own office, I clamped down on expenses and returned $170,000 to the general fund. We're talking, we're always talking to our private sector partners and adopting many of their best business practices. Through executive orders and other actions, I've cut regulations, made it much easier to apply for and receive business permits, eliminated positions and frozen wages and brought in agency heads and board members who, like me, will not tolerate the abuse of the public purse. Not all cost savings come from the top. Much of it comes from public employees themselves. From teachers to park rangers to health care workers, the state's public employees are delivering high-quality service with great professionalism and often little recognition. But that hasn't stopped many public employees from coming up with new and imaginative ways to save money. Let me give you two examples. The first is Randy White, who works for the Oregon Lottery. We needed to upgrade 2,500 video lottery terminals. The manufacturer's proposed price was $450 per terminal. Randy figured out a way to do it for $12.50 a terminal. When you do the math, the saving is over a million dollars. Carolyn Thebes saved the Department of Human Services a half a million dollars just by coming up with a checklist for people applying to get on the Oregon Health Plan. The list greatly reduces the number of pending applications, which reduces administrative cost. Randy and Carolyn are both here today and I'd like you to give them a round of hand. Please stand. I congratulate these great public employees and ask anyone and everyone who works in government to follow their lead by looking for ways to deliver services cheaper, faster, and better. Our bipartisan successes go beyond more jobs, more revenue, and more responsive government. I already mentioned reforming PERS, but that was only the beginning. We created a children's charter which promises to get children ready to enter school and keep children safe, healthy, and adequately fed and sheltered. We set up an employer workforce training fund to help both employers in search of workers and citizens who want to upgrade their skills. After years of deadlock, we passed the largest public works project 
our transportation package since we built the interstate highway system in Oregon. Repairing our roads and bridges will mean thousands of high-paying jobs for Oregon families and thousands of business opportunities for large and small Oregon companies. <laughs> to boost our high-tech sector, we're funding a state-of-the-art research center on the Oregon State University campus called the Oregon Nanoscience and Microtechnology Institute. We also created incentives for research and development jobs to come and locate here in Oregon. Tourism is our third largest industry, but we lag behind most states in promoting tourism. That's why, again, with bipartisan and industry support, we created a tourism promotion fund. This fund is going to pay big dividends for Oregon's economy. With a near unanimous vote in the legislature, we continue to maintain public support for art and culture, which are critical economic assets for our state. <laughs> Oregon's public land use laws have been models for the nation and will continue to be, but we can't expect to attract new businesses to Oregon if we put all land off limits to business. I said when I was running for governor that I would increase the availability of industrial land. We passed legislation to do just that. A few dozen of these new industrial sites are soon, soon or will be shovel ready. This does not mean, and I'm going to repeat this, this does not mean we are abandoning our commitment to the environment. Yes, we want more development, but we're focusing on sustainable development. That means actively recruiting clean industries and promoting the use of renewable energy. There was one other important bipartisan measure that passed last year, the tax bill that was eventually repealed by the defeat of Measure 30. To the people of this state, who are worried about what is going to happen to our schools and other critical services, I have this to say to you. The death of Measure 30 is not the death of good government. It is not the death of effective government. Voters told us to manage the shortfall, and we will. At the same time, we will protect our most vulnerable citizens and invest in our economic future by investing in people. The majority of Oregonians have had their say, and their message is unmistakable. They feel tapped out, unsure about what comes next for their job and their children, and skeptical that government is doing all that it can to cut costs. As I said, we're making changes to restore the public's trust in government. But after two major battles, tax battles, in less than two years, the time has come to say, time out. Measure 30 is yesterday's headline. What I care about is tomorrow's headline, which I want to read. Oregon's economy continues to grow, continues to create jobs, and come to the aid of the budget. In other words, state revenues will grow as the economy grows. A relentless focus on economic opportunity is the best road to a stronger Oregon and a more stable state budget. I know that many of our citizens do not see Oregon getting stronger. When they hear about an economic recovery, they ask, what recovery? I understand that. At another time in my life, I was there. It's not fair to ask a family without a job, a senior choosing between food and prescription drugs, a high school graduate without money for college to see a rising sun from inside the shadows. 
There has also been no let up in the pleas for help that the Oregon Food Bank hears every day. That's why I created a campaign on behalf of the Food Bank that has already collected well over $100,000 to fight hunger. But this fight is not over, so I encourage all Oregonians to give generously to the Food Bank. I would remind each and every one of us, if we choose to see only our strengths and not the pain of our neighbors, then we will have failed ourselves morally. Yes, we can turn our backs on Oregonians who need help and stay true to our belief that there is no better place to live than right here. But we cannot turn our backs on Oregonians who need help and still stay true to our values. Having a community spirit is at the heart of our pioneer spirit. If we walk away from one, we walk away from the other. I pledge to you, I will not walk away. Now, I wish I could say the same for the federal government which is abdicating its responsibility to the workers in this country. Over two million jobs have been lost. Millions more are working part-time when they want to work full-time, working without health insurance, and working in fear today that they'll be out of work tomorrow. Yesterday, the President started running ads touting his support for jobs and workers. Yet. When our bipartisan congressional delegation and I asked the administration to extend unemployment insurance benefits for Oregon's long-term unemployed, the silence was deafening. This does not strike me as compassionate, and it is certainly not the kind of partnership Oregon needs with the federal government. Currently, there is a transportation bill sitting in the Senate that will mean tens of thousands of jobs for the workers in the Northwest and across this country. The President has threatened to veto this bill, even though it is probably the fastest way to create new living wage jobs. The President would be better served following Oregon's lead, where Democrats and Republicans in last year's legislative session put together a transportation package that is both an infrastructures bill and a jobs bill. Mr. President, if you want to be the jobs president, this is your opportunity. Sign the bill. But in reality, we each know there is only so much a state government can do on its own. We cannot alter trade packs. We cannot change the business model of Walmart, whose goal is to import the cheapest goods possible and pay their workers the lowest possible wages. But we can, and I will, make sure that the skills of Oregon workers align with the needs of Oregon companies who are insourcing, not outsourcing jobs. The federal government, unfortunately, has been as short-sighted about children and their education as it has been about jobs. The No Child Left Behind Act is great in theory, but it will not work without a strong federal partner. The law demands high standards, which I agree with, and then tells cash-starved states to expect no help from Washington in reaching those standards. Here's an idea. No more federal mandates without the money. I read recently that the President wants to send a mission to Mars. Now, I'm going to tell you I'm as intrigued by the planets as the next person. However, what this, dec what this country needs and what we need is what we really need to invest in is we need a new Marshall Plan for K-12 through education. It 
If we invest in children and education with the same vision that we showed a half century ago after the defeat of Germany and Japan, we will be able to rewrite history and secure our own posterity. In the meantime, I want you to know that as long as I am the governor, the children of this state will continue to go to the head of the line. As long as I am the governor, I will always measure the success of my job by how many Oregonians have a job that pays them a family wage. As long as I am the governor, I will work night and day and in a bipartisan way to make Oregon government more responsive to the needs of our citizens. And as long as I am the governor, I will reject any vision for Oregon that calls on the people of the state to lower their expectation, compromise their values, or give up on any community, no matter how rural or how remote. I will also reject any vision for Oregon that is fiscally irresponsible. As the federal budget races out of control, the only kind of budgeting we now do in Oregon is smart budgeting. Smart budgeting means that the old days of simply adding more money to whatever an agency spent the year before are over. Now we go through every agency, budget line by line, and focus on essential government functions. The process is rigorous and transparent, frugal and disciplined. If there's money to pay for a program in the current year, but not future years, its funding is going to be scrutinized even more closely because we want services to be sustainable over the long run. And there are no more use it or lose it spending sprees at the end of the budget cycle. I am watching out for that kind of spending like a hawk. Agency managers know me and they know the rule. Just don't do it. On the other hand, we're going to give managers incentives to spend less of their money and to have money left over when the budget cycle is over. Along with smart budgeting comes smart debt man management. We will not mortgage our children's future by borrowing endlessly to pay for current operating expenses. We will not fund programs or fill holes in the budget with one-time revenue sources or anything near the magnitude we did in 2001. The days of rolling up budget shortfalls to the next legislative session are over. We will not go on scavenger hunts where we rob Peter to pay Paul. Doing so is simply bad budgeting. But there is another problem with this, this sort of a scavenger hunt. Paul almost always has more political clout than Peter. So you end up with proposals like the one in the last legislative session which was to take money earned by the Commission for the Blind and give it to some other constituency. It is not fair, and it is not moral, and it's definitely not the Oregon way. Now that you know the vision I reject, let me tell you about my positive vision for Oregon. I see an Oregon with an economy that continues to grow and create living wage jobs an Oregon with an economic environment that attracts new businesses and retains existing ones, an Oregon with a system of lifelong learning that demands excellence and provides high standards and offers citizens many options, from professional and technical training in high school to workforce development to a revitalized network of community colleges and universities, an Oregon with a health care system that fits our budget and the needs of children, seniors, pregnant women, and the poor. An Oregon with a marketing strategy that will help us sell our goods and services to the world. An Oregon with an environment that is understood to be an invaluable economic asset as, and is protected for future generations. An Oregon that practices tolerance and enforces civil rights for all people, no matter their race, religion, ethnicity, our sexual orientation. And an Oregon 
that deeply believes in the redeeming power of hope. How will we reach this vision? With the pretty simple formula that I call the Oregon Equation. The formula is O equals C plus E squared. This is what the equation means. The way to achieve a prosperous Oregon is to take care of our children, grow the economy, and stand guard over our environment. I put them in the same equation because they are linked. We build a prosperous future not by focusing one day on our children, the next day on our economy, and on our quality of life the day after that. We build a prosperous future by understanding the connections between all three. When we educate our children and take care of our children, they are much more likely to grow up and use their brain power to perform jobs that power our economy and much less likely to end up under the supervision of the criminal justice system. When we protect our environment, families want to raise and educate their children here. And sustainable businesses, knowing their employees want a high quality of life, are easier to recruit here. When we grow our economy, revenues increase and can be used to better fund our public schools, invest in job training, and expand access to higher education. These are just three of the many ways that our children, economy, and environment are linked. The dots really do connect. The sum really is greater than all of the parts. There really is an Oregon equation. And if we invest wisely in the right side of the equation, children, the economy, and the environment. We know what we will get on the left side of the equation. Profitable businesses, a rush of new high-paying jobs, educated children, and long-term prosperity for Oregon. That's exactly the direction I intend to lead this great state. Let me start with just education. Just as we too often see the dots and not the links between the dots of children, the economy, and the environment, we do the same with education. We focus on pre-K, our K through 12, our community colleges, our four-year institutions. Workforce training is also looked at separately, but they're not separate. They're all part of investing in Oregonians. They are all part of lifelong learning, and they're all part of building an economy that can produce high-wage jobs and a workforce capable of performing those jobs. Put another way, if the end game is a better economic future for Oregon, and it is, the way to reach that end game is by following a straight line that starts with pre-K and ends with higher education. We can literally change our economic future by investing in people from the very beginning. That's why I will fully fund health care services for children and pregnant women. I'm also going to continue funding SMART, a program that gives adults the chance to read to young children, which better prepares the children for school. And there is much about our schools to be proud of. I'm especially proud of some of the young men and women who are here today. They're from Grant High School. They won the Classroom Law Project's Constitutional Law Competition in Oregon. And now they're planning to go to national Washington, D.C. to engage in the national competition. But most important, they represent the very high caliber of education that is still available in Oregon's public high schools. Here are some other signs that Oregon's public schools still make the grade. We are consistently number one or number two in the nation in SAT scores. Our dropout rate is falling across the state. We're closing the achievement gap. 60 to 70% of our high school students take a curriculum that prepares them for college, twice the national average. And a full 80% of our third graders meet or exceed benchmarks. So don't let anyone say that our public schools are failing. They are not. Our teachers are doing a great job under difficult circumstances. Oregon teachers. I 
I'm going to tell you one thing. Oregon teachers are not terrorists. They... Our teachers are trainers, tutors, mentors, and tremendous assets for our communities. Having said that, and this is the reality, if we're truly honest with ourselves, we have to admit that the, for the last three years, we have seriously shortchanged education. Even the best teachers and principals working with the most involved parents cannot do more with less forever. If we keep cutting our investment in public education, we are certain to end up with an inferior education system. And that is a recipe for economic disaster. When it comes to fighting for putting more money in the classroom, I will never give up. Our children deserve schools that are open for a full year, schools with reasonable class sizes, and schools that have a range of programs, including art, music, language, and programs for the gifted and talented. Last year, I proposed to the legislature a smart and painless way to raise more money for our schools. Under Senate Bill 6, school districts would stop purchasing health insurance separately. Instead, we would pool all these purchases, giving us the power to negotiate a better price. If Senate Bill 6 had passed, we would have saved enough money in the next biennium to add several days to the school calendar. The legislature, by one vote, turned down Senate Bill 6. But I intend to come right back next year with the same proposal. We have to get this done. Our high schools and community colleges must offer young people multiple paths to success, including technical training and professional careers. Oregonians who have been out of school for a number of years or need retraining can improve their skills or change careers by entering a workforce development program. For students graduating from high school or community colleges, there must be a university system that is affordable, accessible, and academically first rate. That means top faculty, modern facilities, and programs that meet every need. Anything less will leave Oregon with a second tier, as a second-tier state with a second-tier economy. That is why I am taking higher education off the back burner where it has sat for at least a decade and making it a priority for my administration. I take this very personally. I know from my own experience the life-altering possibilities that a college education office offers. It is only because of the GI Bill, it opened the door to college and law school, that a young Marine from a Missouri boys' home made his way from the cab of a truck to the seat of the governor's office in Oregon. In recent years, the higher education tank in Oregon has been running close to empty. Programs have been cut, faculty has been lost, tuition has skyrocketed. We need to get higher education off of this downward spiral and start moving forward again. I just, I just overhauled the Board of Higher Education and shined a spotlight on this issue. My charge to the board is simple, bigger, better, and faster. I want less money spent on administration and more money spent on improving quality inside the classroom. Last year, I proposed a plan that would allow all qualified Oregon students the chance to attend a community a college or university in Oregon, public or private. The legislature did not act on my proposal. There was far too much hand-wringing and battling over turf and far too little concern about improving higher education and growing our economy. But I have no intention of giving up. I am asking all Oregonians to join me in creating a fund that will support access to college for every eligible Oregonian and to put this fund in the Constitution where it will serve as an economic engine for generations to come. This is the only way we can truly build intellectual capital in Oregon. 
which will bring us higher paying jobs, jobs that fit the needs of the marketplace, and a vibrant Oregon economy. Even as we invest more in our intellectual capital, we must remember the rest of the equation. That means focusing on the economy and the environment. And I've already said, for the con economy, education is job number one. But we also have a comprehensive economic development strategy that goes beyond jobs and job training. It includes investing in infrastructure, marketing Oregon's products, and negotiating direct airline service from Portland to Europe, Latin America, and Asia. The strategy is also about supporting small and minority businesses, helping farmers hold on to their land by having strong agriculture and food processing sectors, stemming the decline in wood products, and promoting culture, film production, and tourism. When I talk about the environment, I mean both our natural environment and our social environment. A strong social environment begins with public safety. That's why I've ordered a top to bottom review of Oregon's public safety system. Everything from sentencing to shutting down the manufacture and sale of methamphetamine to stopping elder abuse. It's all on the table and it's all going to be dealt with because the one thing I want to make absolutely sure that the people of Oregon are safe in their homes and on the streets of their communities. I intend to see that that pledge is carried out. As for our natural environment, I have a long agenda, which as I mentioned includes sustainable development and renewable energy. Under an executive order that I signed last year, every state agency, including universities, must make sustainable development part of their training, planning, and mission. But my top environmental priority over the next three years is to clean up the crown jewel of Oregon's river system, the Willamette River. I don't, I don't mean just parts of the river, I mean the entire river, from the headwaters east of Eugene all the way to Columbia, to the Columbia. There's, I admit, will be a huge endeavor that we cannot afford alone. That's why I went straight to the president and asked for and received $13 million to complete the cleanup of the McCormick and Baxter Superfund site in Portland Harbor. And I'm working with our congressional delegation to secure millions more from the Army Corps of Engineers to clean up old mine tailings, upgrade dams on, tri on tributaries, and restore wetlands, all to improve water quality and preserve our precious natural resources. I'm also leading the Willamette Cleanup Authority that will explore new ways to fund the restoration of the Portland Harbor. But it's just not government that is stepping up. Our fight to save the Willamette has been joined by a much larger coalition that crosses political and regional boundaries. Salve is helping this fight at the grassroots. Business and environmental organizations are also participating, and so is the Port of Portland. I am extremely proud that so many members of the Oregon community have agreed to be my partners in restoring the health of the Willamette River. This is as it should be. The Willamette River is our legacy and our lifeline for a healthy and happier future. Oregon has been through some rough times, and many of our fellow citizens and for many of them, the rough times continue. But the worst is over. The recovery has started and the economy is growing. Jobs are starting to come back. Government is both more citizen friendly and more cost efficient. If revenue forecasts have to be revised, they're being revised upward. Oregon really is strong and getting stronger. I said when I was running for governor that better days were over the horizon. Now they are above the horizon. So I say to you from the bottom of my heart, although we live in the beautiful west, the sun in the east best symbolizes what's to come. Oregon is rising. Thank you and God bless Oregon.
Thank you, Governor Kulongowski. As City Club members know, City Club members have the privilege of asking our speakers questions. I'd like to extend that privilege to the members of the Grant High School Constitution Team and the Lincoln High School Constitution Team. Our first question, though, will come from our board host, Marcus Samantle. Marcus is a retired Washington County farmer with an extensive history of community involvement, and he's been a board member and a member of the club for many years. Thank you, Marcus. Thanks, Andy. Or Katie King, you are right. City Club is great, and if people aren't members, they ought to be. I mean, where else do you get to have state of the state, face to face with the governor, and then get to face to face, get to ask him questions and hear his answers? So, uh, Governor Kulongowski, when you campaigned and in your state of the state speech just now, you talked about education a great deal and about uh, uh, preschool uh, learning. And my daughter teaches first grade here in Portland, and she's very concerned that kids still are not coming to school prepared to learn. What uh, specifically are you trying to get accomplished in that area? Well, there, there's two things. It is always trying to provide the, the funding for Head Start to give children an opportunity. And the second is, is my commitment, which for the first time got the smart reading program actually put into the state budget. And I continue to believe that the cornerstone of learning is being able to read. And I think that the more opportunity we can give young children to read, I think the better off we're going to be. Let me suggest one other thing, though. And I think it's something that we may all, as adults, have been a little bit uh, negligent in, in recognizing. One of the things I've learned as, as governor is that the public sees education in their mind's eye from their experience when they were in school. And I think a lot of people fail today to realize that many of these children who walk up to this schoolhouse door at five years of age have had a lifetime of experience that most of us have never experienced in our lives. It's about drugs and alcohol, abuse, neglect. There's never been a book in the house. No one's ever read to them. And we lead the public to believe that that child can walk through the door, there's a teacher there, and that teacher can teach that child and give them opportunity, and we can do it cheaply. It can't be done. And at some time, At some time, we're going to have to recognize we have to make the investment, and that's why I said in my speech, you have to get in in the beginning. That is the future of this state. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Dr. Edward Press, uh, City Club member. Uh, Governor, you mentioned that the, uh, the health, you're in favor of health care that fits the budget, and that's a very astute and politically savvy statement, as one would expect from a governor with your skill. That's why Which, I'm the but governor. It, but, it mean, <laughs> but it means that you're either going to cut the health care or increase the budget. And then later on you said that you're strongly in support of health care for children and pregnant women. Well, my question is, uh, does that mean that you're going to plug for more money for children and pregnant women? Let me answer it this way. In the short term, where I have to get to the next biennium, 05, 07, and where I'm at today. What I said with the passage of measure, the failure of measure 30, I said that I got the message that voters have said no. I said at that time I had prioritizing the resources we had, and I said though the standard population was going to be lost in the Oregon health care plan, I was still going to maintain the program for children, for pregnant women. I was going to uh, maintain uh, the um, prescription drug program for seniors. We were going to keep the mental health and drug rehab, and a number of other programs that were around children and pregnant women. I intend to do that. We're doing that when I said in my speech that the $76 million, which I said that we've gotten through, basically program savings and overhead reductions, we're using that money to be able to, be able to restore that population uh, to those services. Uh, I will need the help of the legislature and the emergency board to be able to do that. I know that, and we've been talking with them. Over the long run, I think that you have to look at what the state government can financially afford on health care. 
I was back in Washington, D.C., and I talked to Tommy Thompson because we have a series of waivers, but one of the waivers that we have and we want to maintain is the umbrella of which the Oregon Health Plan sits under, which is the prioritization of all these particular procedures. I believe we're going to get that. What my view is, is that I think we should look at building a health care system that provides at its base health care for every child in this state. If they can't afford it, we provide health care for children and pregnant women. We will grow the program from there. And if that means that we will take some time to bring their parents on, the answer is yes. But as the economy improves and more resources come in, I am committed to seeing that we provide the health care, as I said, with this base and grow the system. The structure of the Oregon Health Plan is very valid. It needs to be economically sustainable, though. Right, right. I understand that. And it's impossible for anybody to provide enough money for all the health care that's needed for everybody. Yes. Ray? Uh, Ray Plani, a City Club member. Governor, you indicated the uh, dedication to sustainable development in Oregon, and you mentioned infrastructure. Uh, we are concerned. Are you also including improvement in the rail infrastructure in the strait, rail passenger service? Many of you don't know this, but I uh, stood on this stage about 25 years ago, and I think Ray asked me the same question then as he did now. Ray, um, the answer is we have another uh, initiative coming before the legislature, which will be a multimodal approach, which we're working with the Port of Portland, uh, the railroad companies. I am a train person. I'll be very frank with you. I think they're an integral part of having a sound transportation system in this uh, state. And I also think it's critical to the state's economy. I've talked to a number of the railroad uh, um, companies already about our efforts, and uh, I think we're going to be successful with it. Ted Kay, City Club member. Governor, you focused on the expenditure side of reforming state government. I wonder about the revenue side. Will you and how will you use the governor's office to reform our state's tax structure? Well, you know, one of the things that uh, I did and I said was time out. And I meant it very clearly because I have been around the state and I've talked to the public. And if you look at what's happened over the last two to four years, I think that they just want to catch their breath. And I think that we have to give them that opportunity. Let me suggest to you, though, that what I am after in the tax system, which is where I was when I first became governor. I actually think that you must develop a tax reform process, if that's where you're going, from the grassroots. I think the public has to be involved in it so they understand it and they're part of it. I don't think this can come just from Salem. I think, I think that there are questions that you have to answer in this system. I think this issue about equity, about tax, you know, who pays and how much, the, the disparity between uh, the personal income taxpayer and the corporate income taxpayer. I think you have to balance the economy as you're trying to grow the economy, but you don't want to abandon our essential social services. I think that you're talking about looking at how does the state actually define its mission as to its core functions, not just what we would like to do. And I think the last thing that this all sits under is that I think the K through 12 governance issue is at the heart of this debate about tax reform. If that's where you're going, you have to make a fundamental decision of whether you want the local control of the school boards at the local level or you want the state to run the school system. I favor local control. I think you look at the tax issue in that light it takes you different places, but it is something we have to talk to. There are a number of organizations. I know the chalkboard project is out. The legislature is looking at a number of these things. But I would suggest to you from my side, on the state side, the issue that I am going to drive is fiscal reform. It is the most important message I think the public wants to hear. I do believe in the creation of a rainy day fund. I think it is critical to this state. If we would have done that in the boom times of 95 to 01, I wouldn't have gotten the question on the health plan. You would have been arguing with me about how to make it more efficient, but we would have preserved it. So I'm more focused right now on the fiscal side of this thing, and I'm going to drive this until actually the public says I'm ready. 
Tom Potter, City Club member. Governor, I was really glad to hear you say that, uh, that Oregonians cherish uh, dignity and that they want to protect uh, those that are in harm's way and that you're a supporter of full civil rights for all Oregonians. I'd like to ask you a question on behalf of my daughter, who's a lesbian and was married two days ago in Multnomah County. Um, As governor, what will you do to protect my daughter's full civil rights and those of the thousands of gay and lesbian Oregonians in the state to ensure that all of them have full civil rights and they're not pushed back into second-class citizenship? Let me, let me uh, take this opportunity uh, to say a couple things. The first thing I want the citizens of Oregon right now to do for me is to step back, take a deep breath, and let's give the process a chance to work. I have requested the Attorney General to look at this issue and give an opinion, and he will do that shortly. I would ask all the politicians and those who's, who want their 15 minutes of fame on this issue to basically stand down. This is a very divisive issue. Everyone in this room knows this. And what Oregon needs now more than anything is we need to come together, not figure out how we're coming apart. And what I know most of all, and I hope you realize this, that members of the gay community are lawyers and doctors, they're judges, they're CPAs, they're electricians, they're plumbers. They are in every occupation in this state. But what I see them as, they're citizens. They're citizens of Oregon and they're citizens of this great country. They pay taxes, they get sick, they cry, they laugh, they bleed, they die. And we have a responsibility to see them in that light. Is they're the same as we are? What I have said is that I believe the civil union is, at this time where we're at, the correct approach. I think you are entitled to all the rights and responsibilities in that civil union as you would in marriage. I don't think there should be any distinguishing between the two. Now, I would suggest something that I've tried for the last 30 years in public life. And with Senator Brown, Kate Brown and I, we've talked about it. Do you know what's interesting about this debate? There is still no general statute that prohibits discrimination against someone in this state for their sexual orientation. Marriage does not give you that. We can still, we have the situation where people are still fired, they're kicked out of their apartments, they're not given service in public places because of who they are. And I think that if we put the same rights and responsibilities together under the civil union, I think we can do both. And that's the direction I'm going to go, and I can assure you in this next session, I'm coming back again because I did it 30 years ago and I'm gonna do it again. I think the discrimination statutes in this country, in this state, should apply to sexual orientation just as it does to race, ethnicity, age. I think we need to get, make sure that every citizen in this state has the same rights and responsibilities. And that's the approach I want to use, but I would suggest to you. Let this process work. My name is Tom Craig. I'm a member of the Grant High School Constitution team and soon to be a member of the City Club. <laughs> a cornerstone of the classroom law project that both Grant and Lincoln are participating in and also a cornerstone of the City Club is civic participation. It's the doctrine that people should be involved in their government 
People should be involved in their local government, their state government. People need to be involved in their communities. What are you doing to help increase that involvement, and what will you be doing to help increase that involvement in the future? I actually, I like this question because I probably spend more time, other than former Governor Roberts and traveling around Oregon, and I go into communities and I bring the government to the people of the state. I spend a great deal of time tra traveling on the eastern side of the state and the southern side of Oregon. I happen to believe that you are absolutely correct. It's how do I attract more people to believe that this government, this system that we use, a civil society uses to solve common concerns. How do I get more people involved in that so that I've got a del deliberate, a thoughtful, and a rational discussion of issues? I am always out there trying with, to get more people engaged. If you look at my appointments to boards and commissions, I try to go off the list of people who have never been involved and get new people in so that I can actually give people new experiences. I'll tell you why your question is so important to me. I do not believe that it is good for Oregon to continue to manage and develop policy for Oregon through the initiative process. I do not believe in the long run. I understand. I understand. I understand the role of the initiative process, and I think that's good. But fundamentally, the citizens of this state have vested the responsibility for policymaking in the legislature and in their elected officials, and that's what I think we have to do more of, is to actually empower the legislature to act on behalf of the citizens more and for other elected officials, including me, to actually always seek out to try to figure out what the public wants and where they want to go. Sometimes we may disagree, but having that ability to get you involved in the process, I think, is critical to banking policy the way it is designed and was designed under the Oregon Constitution. I think we have time for one very brief question, and then okay. the governor needs to get out of here. Oh, Jim Wittenberg with... Hi, Jim. Uh, hi, Ted. How are you doing? I've known you for 31 years now, I think, or 29. And I, I, I love you like a brother in many ways, but Ted, I, I want to tell you, not good enough. Not good enough. And the initiative process, you know, I've been somewhat involved in over the years. We had a little initiative back in 1978, which dealt with the property tax. Jim, what's I'm going to do, I'm do, it real, I'm do it real quick. We got 209,000 signatures still has been the record in the state. Governor Locke says that the legislature can't deal with this problem in Washington State. He's gone to the people of the state with an initiative process. Ted, I have an initiative which I have formed, and it's been 26 years since I've done it. Here's the initiative that says. What's your question? You're asking a question. Jim? Will you, never what mind. Is the, never mind. I'd suggest that you talk with the other. Forget it. You don't want to answer it anyway, Ted. So you know what it is. I haven't heard it. It's a sales tax, Ted. Are you going to be with it or against no. us to do it? Good. <laughs> Governor Kulongoski, in your own words, I think you've helped us see from the shadows into the rising sun, and we thank you for your time today. Thank you.